Hey, Dr. Osborne here with a research update for you. Look, the world is screaming about hydroxychloroquine, but what very few people are talking about are the potentially devastating and dangerous side effects of this medication. It was originally intended for the use as an anti-malarial. So what I did is I went to one of the world's leading researchers to get more in-depth information for you so that you could better understand the side effects of these drugs and make a better decision should you be faced with someone trying to prescribe these medications to you. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Remington Nevin. Now, Dr. Nevin is a medical doctor. He was a former U.S. Ma Army major and preventative medicine officer. He serves as the di executive director of the Quinism Foundation and is faculty associate in the Department of Mental Health at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. His work has been instrumental in improving policymakers' understanding of the potential for long-lasting and permanent neurological and psychiatric effects from, from quinolone antimalarials. So he is the expert of experts as it relates to these medications and the potential devastating side effects. So now we're going to go to an interview that I was able to do with him to get you the full scoop on these medications. I do think what the public may be interested in, based in large part on uh, the president's um, uh, comments on this matter, is, is the use of the drugs for prevention, for general prevention or for treatment of mild illness. But I would, I would point those individuals to the president's own actions. Uh, and and if, if they're interested in the drug for that purpose, they should be asking the president, why hasn't he used his authority to make those drugs available for that purpose? purpose, because it's well within the president's authority to do so. And I think it's very telling that the president, as commander-in-chief, hasn't ordered the use of these drugs for that purpose among our military personnel, for example, who, who are used to receiving antimalarials when they go overseas. So I, I, I think there's probably a little bit of disconnect between what people think the president might be recommending and what he's actually ordering into effect. So, so what I hear you saying is that the general recommendation is for emergency use only. Somebody's life is in jeopardy, and so the use of hydroxychloroquine, for example, might be something that could have a potential impact on whether they live or die? Well, it, it's certainly possible. We, we don't know, right? We don't know what the effect uh, is, but, but there, there is theoretical reason to, to, to think that the drugs might have some, uh, some effectiveness. Uh, and, and the drugs are being used clinically, uh, thanks to the, the president's uh, uh, arguably swift and decisive action to order that they be made available in large quantities in hospitalized settings. But for those who who would who would who would argue that there is a push to limit access to these drugs, for, for those who would clamor for greater access to the drugs, who would clamor for their physicians to prescribe the drug, they should understand that there simply isn't enough of the drug available through the normal supply chains for everyone to have equal access to that as a preventive. And, and if this drug should be decided by leadership to be used as a prophylactic, which is, I think, a, a fairly premature decision at this point, but, but if, if the decision were ever made to truly recommend this drug as a prophylactic, the president has within his authority the ability to make that happen within a matter of days, and he hasn't done that. And I think that should should give people some pause. If if they want to blame anyone for not being able to take hydroxychloroquine to prevent COVID nineteen, they they need to look to no one other than the president because he has the authority to do that. And the fact that he's not doing it, I think, indicates he may not be as convinced of its efficacy or safety as people maybe let may. Be let, may be led to believe. Can can we talk a little bit about efficacy and safety? Then, I know you're the you're the founder of the Quinism Foundation, and uh, have have a long standing history with researching this medication and its neuropsychiatric side effects. Can you talk a little bit to the dangers, the potential dangers of using this medication? So, hydroxychloroquine is a quinoline drug. It was uh, first synthesized, we think, back in uh, 1950, uh, intentionally 
as a safer or better tolerated version of chloroquine, which is very closely chemically uh, related. Uh, but that the chemical substitution of the uh, hydroxy group for a methyl group uh, that led to the drug seemingly being better tolerated uh, also resulted in it being apparently less effective as an antimalarial. And so it was never adopted as a, an antimalarial for widespread use. We continued to use the the less well-tolerated drug chloroquine as our primary antimalarial throughout the 50s and 60s and even beyond. Uh, but hydroxychloroquine, interestingly, because it was better tolerated, it became widely used in the rheumatology community uh, in, in place of other related quinoline drugs that were exceptionally toxic. Uh, and the drug that it primarily replaced was one called quinacrine or adabrin, which was known to cause a very serious uh, neuropsychiatric effects, including uh, 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 frank cases of psychosis. Uh, but also more subtle neuropsychiatric symptoms such as uh, anxiety, nightmares, uh, insomnia, uh, depression, uh, manic uh, symptoms, cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, but but these uh, adverse effects are not exclusive to quinacrine or, or, or the drug adabrin. Uh, they're, they're common uh, features of the toxicity syndrome that's common to all quinolines. So chloroquine has these problems to an extent, hydroxychloroquine to, we think, uh, a significantly lesser extent, but if the drug is taken by 300 million Americans, uh, a not insubstantial number uh, w- would be expected to suffer from these neuropsychiatric effects. So, so the drug is, is not benign, it's not without risk. Uh, a, a, a not insignificant minority uh, of individuals who take any of the quinoline drugs uh, could experience these neuropsychiatric effects. And, and can you describe what some of these effects might be from a symptom perspective, what people might expect to have or experience? So the the disorder that we call quinoline encephalopathy or quinism or chronic quinoline encephalopathy, if it becomes uh, chronic, uh, is marked by a constellation of psychiatric and neurologic uh, symptoms, which we feel are referable to uh, areas of the brain and brainstem that are damaged uh, by the drug's idiosyncratic neurotoxicity. So these symptoms can I- include uh, insomnia, uh, chronic abnormal uh, dreams or uh, nightmares, uh, anxiety, depression, paranoia, uh, and other uh, psychotic uh, symptoms, uh, including uh, true hallucinations uh, or uh, delusions in some cases, uh, and then cognitive symptoms such as uh, difficulty concentrating uh, or a memory uh, impairment, and, and, and also some troubling suicidal ideation or even attempted or completed suicide in, in some cases. Uh, and neurologically, we see uh, symptoms that are referable to uh, specific areas of the brainstem. So uh, tinnitus, subjective hearing impairment, referable to uh, areas near the, the cochlear nucleus, um, dizziness, vertigo, disequilibrium, referable to uh, injury in the vestibular uh, nuclei, uh, paresthesias, uh, tingling or, or um, uh, unusual pain uh, in the uh, extremities, uh, and, and occasionally we think even more complex uh, neurological uh, problems and that are referable to uh, the drug uh, causing widespread dysfunction in, in other areas of the brain. So that's a that's a pretty long list. Can you can you talk a little bit to the nature of of you know, taking the medication, having potentially the the side effects, do they go away? Are they permanent in nature? Uh, is there a combination? What what would you say about about the length of time that the toxicity might might affect somebody? So the the tendency towards this idiosyncratic uh, neurotoxic effect it, it does vary between drugs. It's, it's very commonly seen. Uh, during use with mefloquine, which is a related quinoline drug, which is interestingly also being explored by some uh, for use against COVID-19, less, less commonly seen with chloroquine and, and likely far less commonly seen uh, with, with hydroxychloroquine. When, when these effects occur, they typically will occur early during use, within the first few doses. So in the context of treatment of hospitalized patients, uh, with these drugs, you'll either see it or you won't because uh, of, of the high doses used over a short period. Where confusion arises 
is when these drugs are used long term, for example, in, in uh, the treatment of uh, arthritis or lupus, because the vast amount of clinical experience is among patients who take these drugs for years and, and seem to tolerate them just fine with, with of course, the, the, the slight risk of ocular uh, toxicity. But the neuropsychiatric effects you would not expect to see after years of use. You would expect to see them early during use. And, and typically, uh, rheumatologists, and I think others who use these drugs will admit, uh, a, a fair proportion of the patients who are prescribed these drugs discontinue them quite early, within a matter of days to weeks after starting, uh, for typically vague and undefined reasons. But we're concerned that, of course, the folks that do discontinue these drugs early are those that may be experiencing some of these neuropsychiatric uh, effects and, and simply choose not to take the drug. So that's good. That you should discontinue the drugs at the onset of these neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms. But of course, the danger is that if individuals are, are taking these drugs uh, under medical supervision or not, uh, with the aim of prophylaxing or preventing COVID-19, there's a possibility that they may want to continue taking these drugs even after they experience psychiatric or neurological symptoms. And, and of course, because of the context of the use of these drugs in the midst of a, a pandemic, when people's lives are being uh, uh, disturbed, it's, it's quite easy to imagine that people might attribute symptoms such as anxiety or depression or insomnia, not to the drug, but to the context of uh, the, the stresses caused by the pandemic. And, and if they continue taking these drugs, uh, after experiencing these symptoms, we, we think there's a heightened risk of, of the, the, the more chronic and even permanent effects caused by the drug's toxicity. So in essence, what I, what I hear you saying is that the, the nature of the stress of the pandemic itself, creating almost a post-traumatic stress type of scenario for somebody, could be masked or could be confused or construed as... as um, as, as not being that, but, but it could actually be the drug itself creating those symptoms. Is that, is that pretty accurate? Yeah, that's, that's right. There's, there's two things that could be going on to mask or result in misattribution of, of drug side effects. So the first is that there is some indication that COVID-19 illness, particularly serious illness, is associated with some psychiatric or neurologic symptoms. I don't know how much of that may be already being confounded or confused by the widespread use of high doses of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. So it's entirely possible that cases of reported hallucinations or depression or cognitive impairment uh, in serious cases of COVID-19 might be due to nothing more than the use of high dose chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. It's certainly something to keep in mind, although it wouldn't surprise me if the disease itself did have some neuropsychiatric sequelae, as, as many uh, serious infectious diseases do. But I think more commonly, the risk is that individuals who might take this drug prophylactically at relatively low doses and who might develop symptoms such as insomnia, a mild anxiety, a mild depression uh, from nothing more than the drug could easily misattribute these symptoms to the stresses of the pandemic. And, and it would not surprise me at all to see if, if we have widespread use of these drugs, it would not surprise me at all to see people talking about uh, an epidemic of PTSD uh, from the pandemic, which, which I think could certainly represent nothing more than the effects of widespread use of, of these drugs. That, isn't that what we saw um, in our own soldiers was it was an epidemic of PTSD that you know, was later suspected to be caused by by um, by these medications so with use of mefloquine in particular and again mefloquine is chemically closely related to chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine all of these drugs share a very neurotoxic quinoline core which provides them their anti-malarial uh, activity and, and quite likely underlies some of the antiviral activity, which has been uh, seen in the lab. So these, these drugs are all quite similar chemically. But with mefloquine, we have seen quite a bit of uh, neuropsychiatric illness that has been misattributed to things like post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. I've had many clients tell me 
that on their deployment, the most stressful thing they ever did was go to the chow hall and find out that there was no ice cream left or maybe climb up a steep hill one day. They never encountered uh, any threatened death or actual death. They never encountered any true traumas. You know, they, they were they were on base the, the entirety of their deployment, uh, quite safe and protected. And, but they nonetheless returned home with chronic symptoms such as nightmares and anxiety and insomnia that were automatically, in many cases, attributed to a presumed stressor, and it resulted in, I think, a misdiagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Who, who would you say would be at greatest risk for the potential side effects? Is there, a, is there a biochemical analysis that could be done to rule in or out people who would be bad candidates for the use of these kinds of medicines? So we don't know who is susceptible to these idiosyncratic effects. Again, not everyone is susceptible to the drug's neurotoxicity, we think. We think that uh, a minority, and perhaps with hydroxychloroquine, a relatively small minority, are susceptible to the drug's inherent uh, neurotoxicity. And and we don't know why that is. It, it's plausible that there are genetic factors. It's plausible that these genetic factors might vary with uh, ethnicity and race. But we don't have a test. We don't know if it is genetic, what genes are involved. And so the risk mitigation strategy that has been adopted for mefloquine in particular by drug regulators is to warn individuals, if you're taking the drug and you develop any symptoms at all, then that's an indication that you're susceptible and you should immediately discontinue the drug. So mefloquine has a boxed warning that cautions to immediately discontinue the drug at the onset of any neurologic or psychiatric symptom, and this is why we simply can't use it in the military anymore because these symptoms are, are ubiquitous and it's impossible to do a causation or causality analysis uh, while deployed, so we simply can't use the drug safely. But I think the same considerations should reasonably apply to use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, that if you're taking the drugs and you develop any neurologic or psychiatric symptoms, that could be a potentially ominous sign that you are susceptible to the drugs, uh, potentially permanent neurotoxic effects, and so you should discontinue it. Unfortunately, the test is to give the drug to the patient and for them to, to identify any psychiatric or neurologic symptoms uh, as that early warning of susceptibility. And so go, going back kind of what you just said and what you said earlier, I just wanted to get better clarity. The risk of developing permanent side effect symptoms versus, um, you know, they come and go like a temporary transient uh, side effect. What what should people know about that? Is there a you mentioned earlier, like the longer you take it, the um, and if you're tolerating it well, the less likely you are to develop any kind of permanent neuro, neurological idiosyncrasies. Um, but but is there? I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get at is is there a degree of like from a person's perspective. Who, who, I guess who shouldn't take it if they're if they're really worried about potential toxic side effects? Is that are we saying that high doses in a hospital setting is less likely to create a long term permanent side effect than say a long term uh, rheumatological patient? So un unfortunately, there is no dosing guidance given with the emergency use authorization for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients. Physicians who are using these drugs under the FDA's new authority are free to titrate these drugs to effect and essentially give the drug uh, at any dose that they feel is safe. But with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, there have been reliable reports of uh, effects consistent with permanent neurotoxicity uh, at doses that are close to what we might expect with uh, treatment of or attempted treatment of COVID-19 in hospitalized patients. So I, I have uh, every reason to be concerned, I think, uh, that we will see some, some permanent uh, neurotoxic effects from, from our use of these drugs in hospitalized patients. It would be very surprising if we, we didn't. The real challenge will be to identify these cases uh, as being due to the drug and not have these attributed or misattributed to effects of COVID-19 or, or something else. There's a very real risk of these being misattributed. Uh, now, with use of the drug at 
typical doses seen in, in prevention of malaria or in uh, treatment of rheumatologic disorders. I, I think the, the risk of, of permanent effects is, is probably substantially less unless, of course, uh, the individual continues taking the drug uh, at the onset of these uh, symptoms because, because if one experiences neurologic or psychiatric symptoms with use of these drugs, that could be an indication that the drug, even at low doses, is acting as an idiosyncratic neurotoxicant in their case, that it may be, for example, accumulating in the brain or acting uh, on the brain in a toxic manner. So, so if an individual continues taking the drug, in those circumstances, I, I think that the possibility for permanent effects is, is certainly not trivial. So, so what I hear you saying is, bottom line, if you if you're on the medicine and you're taking it and you're starting to experience any kind of neurological symptoms, the best me- mechanism or the best method forward would be, would be to discontinue its use. So, if the drug is being prescribed to you by a physician, you should of course contact your uh, physician for guidance. But of course, many people will be acquiring supplies of these drugs to use as they see fit uh, from unregulated or unsupervised uh, sources. And so individuals who are taking these drugs without medical supervision should certainly be aware that these are not benign drugs and, and that the onset of neurologic or psychiatric symptoms with such inappropriate use could be an early warning sign of potentially permanent and irreversible neurologic or psychiatric effects. Okay. Can, can you talk a little bit to the mechanism of action? I mean, these, these medicines are originally intended predominantly as an anti-malarial, uh, and here we're talking about COVID-19, a virus, um, different ball game. Can you talk to the mechanism of action of the drug and then how, what you might think or, or maybe you have experience with, you know, why the drug, why some are using it in hospital scenarios with, with any degree of success? So these are remarkable drugs, the quinolines. They're, they're truly remarkable drugs, and, and they have a, a remarkable chemical property that distinguishes them uh, quite significantly from other anti-infectives. Uh, they all share the quinoline molecule as their core. The, the reason that these drugs all contain a quinoline core is because it's this quinoline core that provides them their underlying antiparasitic and anti-malarial activity. Uh, the quinoline uh, molecule, it's, it's essentially, uh, it's essentially naphthalene. I, I say benzene. It's two benzenes stuck together along an edge with one carbon atom substituted for a nitrogen. And that substitution, uh, results in these compounds with their various side chains readily penetrating across multiple uh, barrier membranes, including in some cases we think the blood-brain barrier, uh, but being able essentially to cross unimpeded into different areas of the cell and into different areas of the parasite. And they tend to concentrate in acidic areas of the cell. The, the cells typically have acidic uh, vacuoles where lots of important cellular processes occur. And when these drugs get into acidic compartments, the loose protons, that, that are a quality of acids, uh, attach themselves to the quinoline core. And that essentially turns off the drug's ability to, to cross back over the membrane. And so that results in these drugs accumulating many hundreds to thousands of times their external concentration in these, uh, in these, uh, uh, membrane bound compartments. And it's this property that underlies the drug's effective anti-malarial activity. It, this property that allows them to accumulate uh, in the malaria parasites food vacuole. And it, it, we think we think it's possible and, and even perhaps likely that it's this property that results in their having some inherent antiviral activity because the virus tends to hijack the cellular machinery and, and the virus tends to use these acidic compartments of the cell for their own replication. And so having the drug concentrate in, in these necessary compartments, we think perhaps uh, slows the, the viral um, multiplication and replication down somewhat. We're, we're not certain about that, but it, it certainly seems uh, plausible. 
but it's, but it's this property, this property of accumulating many hundreds to thousands of times in these compartments that that plausibly underlies their neurotoxicity. So if, if the drugs are able to penetrate into brain and aren't metabolized and aren't effluxed from the brain, it's, it, it's entirely plausible that these drugs accumulate in the neurons, uh, in susceptible areas of the neurons, and result in uh, neuronal cell death through a similar process. So it's the same property that makes them effective drugs, we think, underlies their inherent uh, but idiosyncratic toxicity. Now, if a person were to to develop symptoms, is there a, is there a countermeasure, an antidote, or something they could do um, to kind of mitigate the effect of uh, of these medications, or is it is it just going to run its course? No, there's there's no antidote. There's, there's no clear way to uh, either chelate or encourage the rapid clearance or efflux uh, of these drugs. There there are there are some ideas. Uh, out there, uh, which, which I'd refer you to the literature for, but nothing that can be formally, I think, recommended, uh, in a, in a public setting. The, the, the guidance has always been to simply discontinue mefloquine, for example, if one develops the symptoms. Now, the problem is that these drugs vary in how long they tend to be retained in the body. Mefloquine, uh, and uh, chloroquine. Uh, were, were popular anti-malarial drugs because of their long half-life and they could, as a result, be dosed, uh, weekly, which was viewed as being of some convenience. But it's this convenience that's also very problematic in the setting of toxicity. Because of the long half-life of these drugs, it takes quite a long time for them to be cleared if one does develop a toxic effects. Hydroxychloroquine is, is not as bad uh, in that context, it, it seems to be cleared much much faster, for example, than mefloquine. Okay, so no no antidote, but different half lives. Hydroxychloroquine has has a shorter one than than some of the others. Yes, yeah, and I, I think I think that partially explains why hydroxychloroquine seems to be so much better tolerated than these other drugs. Hi, hydroxychloroquine certainly is better tolerated than quinacrine or adabrin that preceded it, uh, and uh, chloroquine. But it's not without risk, and it's not without adverse effects. And, of course, if these drugs are given to tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people, you're going to see the same range and severity of effects that you see more commonly uh, with administration of mefloquine to fewer people. I mean, just by the numbers itself, I, I don't know what the maybe you could you know allude to the you know, kind of the numbers for the risk, right? The, there's a first, there's a risk benefit to using the medicine, but secondarily, there's certainly I, maybe you're aware of, of research that, that shows you know is there a percentage of people that you see reacting, and and so you know from that perspective, if, if you know if a hundred million people get the medication, what's the, what's the likelihood that you know is it five percent, ten percent that are gonna Potentially have a side effect. Do you have any any comment on the numbers? No, unfortunately, we don't. We we don't have as good information on the the incidence of uh, neuropsychiatric adverse effects with hydroxychloroquine as we do with uh, chloroquine and certainly with mefloquine. Mefloquine, as an example, uh, results in in psychiatric or neurologic symptoms in a substantial minority of uh, people who take it. Uh, at the, the usual preventive dose of 250 milligrams once weekly. At least 10% experience uh, nightmares or vivid dreams, 10% experience uh, insomnia, between 1 and 10% experience uh, true anxiety, uh, and a similar number experience uh, depression. Uh, and there's every reason to think that uh, more severe symptoms, such as psychosis, uh, paranoia, significant cognitive impairment, uh, occur uh, on the order of at least one in a hundred individuals. And it's these, it's these symptoms, uh, that if the individual does not discontinue the drug at their onset could result in these being permanent. So there's a very significant potential for mefloquine to cause very, very high rate of lasting neuropsychiatric symptoms. Hydroxychloroquine is probably significantly less risky than, uh, mefloquine, but we can't unfortunately quantify it because the drug never underwent the type of uh, well-controlled, randomized, blinded trials uh, that uh, mefloquine subsequently underwent years after its licensing. We simply don't know. And hydroxychloroquine tends to be used in a, in a very specific and distinct 
population. It tends to be used in more elderly uh, patients who are already ill with uh, fairly significant disease. It's not typically used in, in uh, healthy asymptomatic people. And so that tends to uh, bias or skew, uh, we think, the reporting of, of adverse effects. There, there really hasn't been the type of high-quality evidence for us to say confidently what percentage will experience these symptoms. But they, but they do occur. And with enough people taking the drug, particularly as is being considered by some, uh, we will see many, many cases of, of these effects across the population. Now, what matters, of course, is if, if this is worth it, right, in, in treating what could be or preventing what could be a, a potentially deadly disease. But we simply don't know. We have no idea uh, whether this drug is effective at all in preventing uh, COVID-19. So, so we simply don't have any information on which to base a rational risk-benefit analysis. Do you, do, are you familiar or aware of any, any research in, in rheumatology that, that might allude to even an approximation of potential risk? There, there are some. There, there are some trials that have been uh, done in the rheumatology community uh, in, in, in an appropriate fashion. Uh, looking at the incidence of side effects. But my concern is that these studies, I, I'm not familiar with any study that has done a good job assessing neuropsychiatric symptoms in a valid and reliable way. It, it's unfortunately not enough to simply ask people in a study, have you been experiencing any neuropsychiatric symptoms? Because we know that people tend to underreport symptoms like this. If, if I gave you a drug and it could cause uh, you to have very disturbing dreams that make you question your own sanity. Or if I give you a drug that, that causes you to have hallucinations, you're very unlikely to report that for obvious reasons, right? Because that could have some significant consequences if, if people think you're crazy. So we, I don't think we've structured the studies in such a way as to encourage people to be fully open and honest about the range of neuropsychiatric effects they've experienced. And this becomes, unfortunately, a self-fulfilling prophecy because rheumatologists and other physicians develop a familiarity with the drug's effects and they conclude that it has very little risk of neuropsychiatric symptoms. And, and that tends to be communicated to the patients who then might feel um, discouraged from reporting su such symptoms if they occur. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Is, is there anything that, that you would like to add ab about this class of medications and what people might want to think about um, if they're faced with the potential decision that they, you know, they may need this? I, again, I know you can't give generalized medical advice to the world, but um, again, just pulling from your, from your knowledge base, if, if there's anything else you'd like to add, love to hear it. Well, I think it's important that that the public understands the legal context uh, through which these drugs have been made available for use in hospitalized patients. Uh, these drugs are licensed, and so they are available for physicians to prescribe off-label for any indication that a physician sees fit. But the president has not been promoting such off-label use, and hospitals are not taking advantage, for the most part, I think, of these opportunities for off-label use. Instead, hospitals are being encouraged to obtain quantities of these medications from something called the Strategic National Stockpile, which is run by the U.S. government. And the temporary emergency approval that the FDA granted for use of these drugs in hospitalized patients extends to quantities of these drugs obtained from the stockpile. And when the drugs are obtained in this manner, it completely immunizes everyone involved from any legal liability. So if someone, for example, dies from an overdose of these drugs, by federal law, they cannot seek any damages at all. And this is a very unusual situation. It's, it's, it's unheard of in medicine for people to have no legal recourse. But this is the structure that we have implemented use of these drugs in hospitalized patients within. And I, I think that should give people some pause. There's a reason why we're only using these drugs within this legal framework. It's because it's unknown, 
what the risks are. They could be significant. Uh, and this is a way to essentially permit unbridled experimentation without any risk to those involved. So not not knowing, not really being able then to make an informed decision or or, or adequate informed consent. Well, ima- imagine if you were hospitalized for COVID nineteen and you're at, at fairly modest risk. You 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 may have an extended hospitalization, but you're not going to die uh, a priori from the infection. And and let's say you're given a high dose of chloroquine. By your, uh, by your physician, per- perhaps with the most minimal of informed consent. If you're given high dose chloroquine and you experience uh, a neuropsychiatric reaction to that, for example, uh, the permanent uh, vestibulopathy, which has been reported, then you'll emerge from the hospital essentially with your course of COVID-19 unchanged, potentially, by administration of chloroquine but you'll walk out with a new permanent disability due to nothing more than the use of Clark. You will have no legal recourse. You will not be able to sue the doctor who prescribed you the drug. You won't be able to sue the pharmacy or pharmacist that dispensed it, and you won't be able to sue the hospital. So I, I, I think it's important to keep these legal protections that, that we are operating under with use of these drugs in mind. If the drugs were as, if the drugs are as safe, as are claimed by some, then why do we need these very strong, all arguably unprecedented legal protections against liability to use them? Yeah, understood. Well, Dr. Nevin, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to, to come on with me today and and, uh, and talk more about, about these medications. If people want to learn a little bit more about hydroxychloroquine and other um other medications of its class, where, where can we send them for more information? So uh, we run a nonprofit called the Quinism Foundation, Q-U-I-N-I-S-M. You can visit quinism.org to uh, learn more. And uh, from there, you can link to my uh, website that contains uh, some of my uh, research papers and publications and media articles discussing uh, these concerns for the broader Quinoline class, including the method. Fantastic. We'll put a link up um, underneath this. I, again, I, I greatly appreciate you taking time to answer the questions and, and um, really help us educate the public a little bit more about these risks and, and uh, you know potential mechanisms they should be concerned with. So thanks so much for your help. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Happy to speak anytime. Well, have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So now you've heard it from, again, probably the arguably the world's leading research expert on the toxicity of, of hydroxychloroquine and other quinine-based medications. But now let's talk a little bit about why hydroxychloroquine in the first place. What is so magical about this particular medication that um, that has an impact or an effect against COVID-19? So I want to pull up some research for you to help you understand a little bit better. Now, one of the things that this drug has been shown to do is it increases very rapidly it crosses over the membranes inside of the cell so it can get into the molecular machinery inside your cell and it can disrupt their usage but one of the reasons it's able to do that so well is because this particular medication acts as a a gate agent for zinc meaning it helps pull zinc into the cells and into the cell organelles those little membranes inside the cell where all of your molecular machinery runs and so by pulling zinc into and concentrating zinc into these organelles zinc has a plethora of antiviral properties that I want to that I want to show you about so again the research shows that hydroxychloroquine pulls zinc into cells because it acts as, a, as what's called an ionophore which in essence means it binds zinc and allows it to penetrate into the cell membranes much much easier thus increasing the concentration of zinc as a matter of fact this study published uh, actually just recently published demonstrated that um, again that 
hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine increase free zinc ions in the lysosomes, into, into these little structures inside your cell. Um, in essence, again, what I was just saying is that it increases the, the load of zinc inside the cell. Now, why is that important? The role of zinc as an antiviral has 50 plus years of research behind it. As a matter of fact, this research review that I'm putting up for you, you can see an abundance of evidence has accumulated over the past 50 years to demonstrate the antiviral activity of zinc against a variety of viruses and via numerous mechanisms. So let's talk a little bit about some of the human studies. Now, there are no human studies with COVID-19 and, and, uh, and SARS-CoV, which is what we're talking about now, but I wanna pull the research and some of the summaries from some of the actual human clinical trials that have actually been done that show zinc is very, very effective as an antiviral. So I'm gonna pull, put up a diagram for you again from this same review that was recently published. So you can see this first study that the antiviral or therapeutic effect of zinc, it reduced viral load following a stem cell transplant. The next study reduced duration and severity of outbreak. Next study, again, reduction in outbreak recurrence. And then we have uh, studies in experimental rhinovirus or the common cold where zinc was uh, capable of reducing the duration of illness, reducing the symptom severity, reducing the frequency and duration of symptoms as well. And then we have studies on viral warts where zinc improved clearance of warts after one to two months, clearance of warts based on concentration of zinc used, improved clearance of warts, some multiple studies there. And then we have research studies on laryngeal papillomatosis and HIV um, leading to resolution and reduction of infection, increasing CD, uh, CD4 T cell counts, in other words, improving immune system uh, cell counts. And we have research on zinc and chronic hepatitis C as a viral infection, where it's enhanced, leads to enhanced response to IFN or interferon treatment uh, and reduced liver enzyme damage, reduced ferritin. So again, zinc is, not, there's no mystery that zinc plays a major role as an antiviral and, and there are many examples in, in human studies and also in animal studies. I didn't list those here for you, but numerous animal studies as well. Again, nothing on COVID-19, it's too new. But if we look at this next diagram or this next slide, this is an image taken from the same uh, research paper showing you the different mechanisms of action that have been shown that where zinc plays a role. So you can see here zinc interferes with the viral replication cycle and this includes free virus inactivation, it includes inhibition of viral uncoating, it includes a viral uh, inhibition of viral genome transcription and inhibition of viral protein translation and polyprotein processing. So in four different ways zinc has been shown to interfere with the virus's capacity to make you sick. Now we're, again this these studies have all been shown in other viruses and not COVID-19, but again, this is the front line, the researchers on the front line that are using hydroxychloroquine. I'm trying to give you some insight into, into the most likely reason why it's working. So let's, let's switch gears for a minute because I, I, I brought Dr. Remington in to give us the insight on the potential for toxicity of using hydroxychloroquine. And I showed you research that shows that one of the mechanisms of hydroxychloroquine was that it actually increases intracellular zinc. And then I showed you research that showed that zinc has multitudes of researched and backed antiviral properties and immune supporting properties. So now I wanna talk about something natural that we know can act similar to hydroxychloroquine, and that is quercetin and another substance called epigallocatechin gallate. Uh, these two compounds naturally found in foods act very similar to hydroxychloroquine in terms of acting as a zinc ionophore, meaning they grab onto zinc and pull it and concentrate it inside the cell and inside the cell membrane and inside the organelles in, in the cell. So again, using these plant compounds, we know already increases zinc. This research study I'm putting up for you here, you can see the, the study confirmed that the polyphenols, which is what quercetin is, transport zinc cations across the plasma membrane independently 
of plasma membrane zinc transporters, meaning that uh, they bypass the specialized transporters for zinc on the membrane and they bring zinc straight in. The ionophore activity of dietary polyphenols may underlay the raising of labile zinc levels triggered in cells by polyphenols and thus many of their biological actions. In other words, quercetin and epigallocatechin gallate can both bring zinc into the cell Potentia potentiating many of its different antiviral properties. So again, if you're trying to protect yourself in the best way, again, let's just be clear, this is not me recommending quercetin or epigallocatechin gallate as a treatment for COVID-19. I'm trying to give you some natural things that you can do to protect and to preserve your health. Um, and so some of the things you can do are food source based. So we look at this diagram. These are different food sources of quercetin, meaning if you have ample quantities of these items in your diet and, the, and you're gonna get adequate quercetin in your diet, then you're gonna have better uptake of zinc by your cells potentially. And so apples, berries, grapes, broccoli, onions, and black tea, all very good dietary sources of quercetin but we also have epigallocatechin gallate, which is found predominantly in green tea. So those of you who like your cup of green tea every day, this is one of the wonderful reasons why green tea is so beneficial, is this compound again. One of its side effects is it helps pull zinc into the cell. So if we could summarize, Everything we just talked about, the world is, is running toward hydroxychloroquine. I think the big danger there is, is the potential for toxicity and permanent neurological damage. One of the reasons we believe hydroxychloroquine works is because it is an ionophore for zinc and it pulls zinc into the cell, making zinc have the capacity through all of its different antiviral mechanisms to help protect you. But we have two natural substances that also act as zinc ionophores in the form of quercetin and epigallocatechin gallate. These things can be found in foods. They can also be found in supplements should you desire to supplement with them. My advice to you would be avoid chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine if at all possible. If you're in the hospital and somebody's trying to save your life, maybe that's a different matter. But uh, many people are running toward taking preventatively the chloroquine based medicines. And I think that's foolish. I think it's a very bad idea. And I would discourage anyone from doing that, especially without the supervision directly of their doctor. You heard it in, in Dr. Nevin's words, Dr. Remington Nevin in his words, were that uh, these drugs have the very real potential to create very real psychiatric problems, neurological problems, among other issues. So hopefully that's helpful for you in making and helping you to determine the best decision as you move forward during this coronavirus pandemic. This is Dr. Osborne with Gluten-Free Society and another research update wishing you excellent health. Have a great day.